Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Kate Lauman, social media consultant for SFM Health. Welcome to our Google Hangout on Air. Today we're talking about sleep. Sleep for you, sleep for your kids, how much you need and what could be hindering you from getting that perfect night's sleep. Now during this chat we would love to hear from you. You can tweet us, post on our Facebook page or Google Plus. Just search for SSM Health. You can also email your questions. Use the email address ask SSM at SSMHC.com. And now we do want to, as we answer your questions today, we want you to keep in mind this is for informational purposes only. If you have questions about your health, please speak with your health care provider. We have two physicians joining us today, Dr. Lancer from Dean Clinic in Janesville and Stoughton, Wisconsin. Also, Dr. Johnson from the SSM Medical Group in St. Louis. We'll get to those physicians in just a moment, and then we will get to your questions. Now, first off, let's turn things over to Dr. H. Thomas Johnson, Pediatric Sleep Specialist with the SSM Medical Group. Dr. Johnson, thanks for being with us today. Okay, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about some pediatric sleep issues and uh, hopefully answer some questions. So, let's, we'll start out uh, with a few sleep, pediatric sleep facts. So, uh, by the age of two, most children have actually spent more time asleep than awake and a child will actually spend 40% uh, give or take of his or her, her childhood asleep. And about a third of a person's life is actually spent asleep. So a lot of time in bed. So how common are sleep problems in children? More than one third of elementary school children will suffer from sleep problems and up to 40% of adolescents have significant sleep complaints. So it's uh, uh, pretty common in our children. So what is the function of sleep? Well, we're learning more about sleep every day, but what we do know is it's required for life. Every living thing sleeps. It recharges your batteries at night. So sleep is sort of like food for the brain. It helps form your memories, helps organize your learning, helps your body, or your body does most of its growing while asleep. We also fight infections while we're asleep. So we're, we're actually making antibodies to help fight off those, uh, those bugs that we get. Uh, sleep is especially important for children as it directly impacts mental and physical development. Um, and plus, there's a lot more that we, we don't know about. So we're learning more, and, uh, and uh, so stay tuned. So how much sleep do children really need? Well, it really can vary uh, person to person, child to child. Uh, but a general rule of thumb is so uh, total hours of sleep per day, including sleep at night and naps. Uh, newborns zero to two months old uh, average about 14 hours, but that can vary. You know, the normal range is typically 12 to 18. Infants uh, three to 11 months, uh, 12 to 15 hours total. Uh, toddlers one to three years, about 11 to 14 hours. Uh, most toddlers will. Uh, consolidate down to one nap a day, usually by at least a year and a half. Uh, it's common to sleep about 10, 10 or so hours at night and a uh, two hour nap. Uh, preschoolers, three to five years old, 10 to 13 hours. Typically naps are uh, typically stopped around four years old, but some much earlier and uh, can be as late as uh, seven, seven years old. School age, good rule of thumb is about 10 hours a night uh, up until your your older children and then teens, uh, typically 8 to 10. Typically teens get, uh, due to all the demands and social activities, are often uh, don't get enough sleep. And adults, it can vary. Um, uh, Dr. Lancer will talk more about this later, but typically 7 to 9 hours, average is 7.2. So sleep problems in children. So studies show that up to 25 to 50 percent of children diagnosed with ADHD have sleep disorders. And if their sleep is fixed, a lot of these children, their ADHD improves, or sometimes they don't even meet, they no longer meet criteria for ADHD. And that can be similar with learning and behavioral problems. So a good way to think about this is if a parent has a child that normally sleeps really well, but has one bad night of sleep because maybe they went to a ball game, there was a thunderstorm. They had friends over, they, so they don't get, they didn't get as good a sleep as they normally do. They know the next day their child's usually more irritable, they're more inattentive, and they do not behave as well. So if you really think about it, 
if a child sleeps poorly every night, secondary to poor sleep or lack of sleep, uh, they can often display these symptoms every day, leading to diagnosis of ADHD behavioral disorders and learning disorders. And a lot of these disorders are not recognized by healthcare professionals or even parents. A lot of parents have sleep disorders themselves, uh, often not diagnosed, and they assume that what they're doing is normal and often snoring, and they sort of assume the same with their child, but it's actually impacting their life. So treatment can be really life-changing for the child and the parents. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a common story, parent, the child's waking up multiple times a night, it takes hours to fall asleep, and so that can not only be hard on the child, but can be hard on the parents and cause parental stress and really disrupt the family. Uh, so, you know, it's not that uncommon if we can fix the child's sleep issues and help them sleep in a more reasonable, normal range that a lot of times the children will improve in school and with their behavior and also improve the family dynamic and can ultimately uh, help the child succeed in school and in life. So common problems, uh, sleep problems in children. So uh, insufficient sleep is a big problem and that can be because of different reasons. That's a common problem in teenagers and, and uh, can really disrupt their lives. Poor sleep hygiene, which we'll talk about in detail later, and that's probably the most important thing uh, that if you take away from anything from my talk is, is uh, making sure that they're, they have good sleep hygiene. Obstructive sleep apnea and snoring is a common problem in uh, uh, children and adults. Behavioral insomnia, a lot of children um, have limit setting issues. A lot, of, a lot of children, especially young babies, they fall asleep. Um, being rocked or held, and then when you will actually wake up naturally several times a night, and when they wake up naturally, uh, they can't put themselves back to sleep. So a lot of that, fixing that is getting them to fall asleep drowsy but awake in bed by themselves. Restless leg syndrome is a common problem throughout the life, and we see a lot of children with it. A lot of growing pains, leg discomfort at night is actually fits into that, and uh, it's a fairly common problem that can really disrupt children's sleep. Sleepwalking and sleep terrors uh, can occur and can be very disruptive. And then nightmares is also a common problem that we see in younger children. So poor sleep hygiene. So what is sleep hygiene? Well, it's basically your sleep habits. So uh, if, if you have poor sleep habits and your children have poor sleep habits, it's really going to disrupt your, your sleep. So sleep scheduling is very important. Uh, your child should try to, you should really try to get your bed, your child to bed about the same time every night. Of course, that's going to fluctuate some depending on what's going on in life and, and typically weekends or later. We usually recommend not having the weekends go more than an hour uh, past the, the weekday bedtime. If you get much more than that, it makes it really hard to wake up and uh, go to sleep uh, early the next week and actually can cause some jet lag. Uh, and making their bedtime about the same time every day too. Uh, and making sure your child goes to bed early enough that they get enough sleep. If you have a toddler and you're, and you're only letting them go to bed, at, they go to bed till 10 and wake up at 6, they're probably not getting enough sleep. So bedtime routine is essential, especially with young kids. Usually we recommend a 20 to 30 minute bedtime routine. That's pretty similar, about the same every night. Uh, and usually a, a common routine is you take the child takes a bath, they put on their PJs, uh, they brush their teeth. They usually like like you to dim the lights. Uh, dimming the lights tells your brain, hey, it's light, it's getting dark outside, it's time to go to bed. So it actually allows your brain to secrete, secrete a hormone called melatonin. Um, and then once the lights are a little dim, try to sit down, read a book outside of bed. Uh, of course, you need enough light to read the book, but try to get it fairly dim. Read, read to them, or if they're old enough, have them read to you, which has additional benefits besides bedtime routine. Uh, and after a while, then, or you can sing a song or talk about the day, some type of quiet time, uh, say your prayers, go to bed. It's important to have your child fall asleep by themselves without you present. So if they unnaturally or naturally wake up at night, they know how to put themselves back to sleep. So caffeine is a big problem. Uh, caffeine, you want to avoid at least three to four hours before. Really, six hours is ideal. 
I usually say nothing, you know, try to avoid it uh, after lunch or early afternoon. It can really stay in your system. Um, even if you fall asleep okay with caffeine, it can still make your sleep more disruptive. Uh, caffeine is commonly found in dark sodas and energy drinks, coffee, iced tea, and chocolate. So for children, it's important that the hour before bed uh, that you really try to have quiet time even before the bedtime routine. If they're doing high energy activities such as rough play or video, high stimulating video games, it's hard for them to wind down and then eventually fall asleep. So television and electronics are a big problem. Uh, really try to keep the TV out of your child's room. Uh, it can be a bad habit. It's hard to, hard to break. Um, the, uh, it's also more, it's hard to, to control what your children are watching. And other electronic devices too, uh, especially computer games, cell phones, help, handheld computer games. Uh, a lot of teenagers will text back and forth. So for a number of reasons this is not good. Um, the TV sort of keeps them stimulated. The, the blue light coming off the TV will actually suppress melatonin and keep you awake. And for a lot of, especially texting back and forth, the anticipation of re receiving messages and needing to respond will not allow the mind to relax and fall asleep. So if you do have a child, it's hard to break, but one thing you can do is turn it to a boring TV show uh, that they would not like for, for a, a week or two, and then turn it on just the white fuzz for a week or two, and then, or even shorter period of time, and then just have a background white noise such as a fan. So. But uh, those are a little bit of advice, but it is tough to break once it's, you know, once children have established that habit. So naps should be geared towards the child's appropriate age and needs. So if, uh, if a five, six-year-old that doesn't necessarily need naps is taking naps, they're not going to have a hard time falling asleep when they're uh, when they uh, try to go to bed. Or if you try to run the naps late, like five, six o'clock, then they don't have enough drive to fall asleep when it's uh, bedtime. Exercise is very important. We're, we're made to, to stay active during the day, so if your child's uh, not getting up and moving around, they're going to have a lot harder time falling asleep. So obstructive sleep apnea is a big problem. Uh, you have it at any age. Um, we see it in children. If children snore on a regular basis, and I'm not talking loud snoring where you can hear it down the hall, but even just mild snoring where you can hear it in the room just next to the child. If they're snoring regularly, they're not sick, they don't have a cold, and it goes on, you know, it's going on for a couple months, then there's concern. And if they have big tonsils, they have problems growing, they have chronic headaches, they're overweight, they have behavioral tension learning problems, they're a little bit older and they're bedwetting over six or seven, those could all be signs of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and you know we recommend uh, a sleep study, and uh, if that's positive for sleep apnea, uh, there's some very effective treatments. So in summary, sleep problems in children are very common. They're often uh, ignored and easily missed. Uh, we don't really do a good job in training our healthcare professionals to sleep. Up until recently, we've always thought it's considered sleep as just a stasis where you're just nothing really happens, but over the last 10 to 20 years, we've really realized that, hey, there's a lot of problems that can go on. We spend a thir about a third of our life asleep, and we really need to focus on this, because optimal sleep is very important for your health, uh, especially as the mind is growing and developing. Uh, it's even more important, um, and so really uh, making sure children uh, sleep well and uh, have their sleep disorders uh, treated can ultimately result in um, you know, helping the child achieve in school and in life. And in addition, uh, you know, it, it's important for the families too. So, um, sleeping well not not only uh, helps the child, but helps uh, sleep deprived parents and helps the family unit. Dr. Johnson, thank you very much. Um, a lot of good information. And if anyone watching has a question for Dr. Johnson, please email it at asksm at ssmhc.com. Now let's turn things over to Dr. Mark Lancer, neurologist and sleep specialist with Dean Clinic. Dr. Lancer, thanks so much for being with us today. Right, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Johnson. It was a very informative talk. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, problems in adult sleep medicine. Uh, basically, the first one being is how much time do you need to sleep? I think many of us have been sleep deprived over the years. Um, the, there's been a lot of studies done and recently our academy came out with a recommendation and sort of the magic number for sleep is to try and get about seven hours of sleep a night. Um, studies show that people who sleep less than six or more than eight hours a night tend to have more of certain health problems. So if you can get somewhere in between that, you're probably doing okay. Now there are some caveats. Some people need less or at least sleep less and some people sleep more. Who sleeps less? Generally older adults. And who sleeps more? As Dr. Johnson just said, children. Uh, children tend to sleep uh, more than, 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 than adults do. Um, what are different factors that affect your sleep? As we mentioned, age is one. Another is medications. Uh, some medications make you sleepy. Some keep you awake. Uh, ambient temperature in the room. Um, sometimes uh, if it's a little warmer, people have more trouble sleeping. If it's cooler, they tend to have less trouble sleeping. And then pain. Uh, obviously, if people are in pain, they tend to have more trouble sleeping. Uh, the different sleep disorders that I'll touch on uh, include insomnia or trouble falling asleep, sleep-related breathing disorders or uh, sleep apnea is the main one there, the hypersomnia is mainly narcolepsy, circadian rhythm disturbances or disturbances of the biological clock, parasomnias, uh, different, different things we'll talk about in children again, and then sleep-related movement disorders, uh, mainly restless leg syndrome. Next slide, please. Insomnia, the most common form of insomnia is what's called psychophysiologic insomnia. Psychophysiologic insomnia, uh, basically put, is that when I fall asleep, my brain turns off and I fall asleep. People who have psychophysiologic insomnia, they fall asleep, their brain turns on. Uh, and they have difficulty figuring out how to turn it off. And there's a variety of different reasons why that happens and different ways to learn how to make it turn off. The paradoxical insomnia is one where people think they're not sleeping, but in fact they are. Uh, a lot of those people are what I call clock watchers. Adjustment insomnia is, for instance, if you get a new bed or move into a new house, you might have a little trouble falling asleep adjusting to the new environment. And then poor sleep hygiene, Dr. Johnson talked a lot about. I'll skip over that. Um, and then the others are, are minor. So let's go to the next slide. The uh, diagnosis of insomnia is mainly obtained through history uh, and sometimes having people keep a sleep log so we can really get an idea of exactly how much time people are spending in bed. An actigraph is a, is a little machine that records your sleep. Nowadays those are built into a lot of people's Fitbits and things like that that they're wearing. Treatment for insomnia is very difficult. Uh, the best treatment is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. Simply put, it's teaching you how to turn your brain off uh, instead of uh, having it turn on. And there are different methods for doing that. And so we, uh, you know, train people in, in these methods. They can be trained either by a psychologist or there's a variety of online programs that people can use to sort of teach themselves how to turn their brain off. And then there are a whole number of medications used to treat insomnia, both over-the-counter medications and prescription medications. And a lot of people use medication to help themselves fall asleep, some of which is good, some of which is bad. A lot of these medications can have lingering side effects, so we a lot of times don't recommend them. Next slide, please. The sleep-related movement disorders, most people have heard of restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome you know, happens actually when people are awake and prevents them from falling asleep sometimes. When they lay down and go to bed at night, their legs need to move and they need to get up and walk around, so they have trouble falling asleep. The periodic limb movement disorder occurs after you fall asleep and your legs jerk and move around, waking you up. These two diseases are, are very, uh, they're linked. Most people who have one have the other, although some people have just one and not the other. It's relatively uncommon. Bruxism or teeth grinding is, uh, is a problem in some people. And then the rhythmic movement disorder is a relatively uncommon problem. Next slide. To diagnose restless legs or the limb movement disorder, you have to have an unpleasant sensation or urge to move your legs. It typically is worse when you're at rest or sedentary, worse in the evening or at night, and gets better when you up and move. That's uh, sort of, if you don't have those four things, you probably don't have restless leg syndrome by definition. Uh, what causes restless legs? We're not sure. 
we are sure it's not a problem with the legs. It's more of a brain problem as far as what we understand right now. And it can be associated with a variety of other disorders, iron deficiency, pregnancy, what's called polyneuropathy or peripheral neuropathy, and certain medications can cause it. And the treatment is mainly with a variety of medications or sometimes iron supplementation if you're low in iron. And then uh, now they've actually uh, approved, FDA approved a little vibrating stimulator that you can put in the bottom of your bed and it kind of stimulates your legs. And that's now been approved for treatment of restless legs as well. Now, obstructive sleep apnea, when people say they have sleep apnea, this is generally what they're talking about. Uh, it's a very common thing. It's the most common thing we see people in our sleep center for. Uh, the main symptoms are snoring, although not everybody who snores has sleep apnea. Witnessed apnea, many times the patient's spouse or bed partner will actually witness the people stopping breathing when they're sleeping. Uh, frequent nighttime awakening excessive daytime sleepiness, and occasionally waking up with headaches or some sort of fogginess in the morning. We diagnose sleep apnea by taking an accurate history, including sometimes history of the bed partner, and then performing a physical exam. There are certain physical findings that increase risk for sleep apnea. Uh, narrowing of the airway in the back of the throat or a crowded airway increased risk for sleep apnea. Also, uh, men with a neck circumference bigger than 17 inches or a collar size bigger than 17 or women larger than 15 inch neck circumference have increased risk for sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Now in order to diagnose it we generally will perform a sleep study. Many people have heard of this. We can refer to it as a polysomnogram. Um, the polysomnogram is an in-lab or in-hospital monitored sleep study where people have uh, uh, wires glued onto their head and nasal and oral thermistors and all kinds of straps wired on them. Uh, many people have heard about this test. We also now have a home sleep study that we can perform that you can do in your own bed at night and it's a uh, little uh, recording device that you can get in the mail and mail back and it automatically sort of downloads the information over the airways for us to look at. And in people who we think are really highly likely to have sleep apnea, that home sleep study uh, can avoid you having to come into the hospital. Treatment of sleep apnea, again, varies on how bad it is and, and certain other features related to the patient. Number one, positional therapy. Many people have more problems with sleep apnea on their back, and if we can keep them from sleeping on their back with various mechanical measures, they won't have any problems. Oral appliances, there are certain mouth guards that can be used to prevent people from having their sleep apnea. Generally, that's only indicated if the sleep apnea is mild or moderately severe, and mainly when they're on their back. CPAP, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Continuous positive airway pressure, it's really the mainstay of treatment that we have. And when people talk about being on a sleep machine, that's what they're talking about is CPAP. Um, surgery, there are a variety of different surgeries that we can use. Uh, the outcome is uh, not always the best. And now they've actually invented a neurostimulator that you like a little pacemaker that you wear that can help to prevent sleep apnea. Um, the goals of treatment. Number one, we want to make you feel better. People who have sleep apnea generally are tired during the day. If we can treat it, they're generally less tired during the day, although not always. And then long-term treatment effects. Uh, sleep apnea has been linked to an increased risk for a variety of diseases, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes. Some studies even say cancer has increased risk in sleep apnea patients. We think if we can treat that sleep apnea, we can prevent you from having some of these health problems down the road. Next slide, please. This is just a, a really put in here for a picture of what a, a CPAP machine looks like. It's the thing on the nightstand next to the bed. It connects by a hose um, uh, onto some sort of a mask that fits either on or around your nose or around your nose and mouth to seal your airway so that the machine can pump air, not oxygen, just plain air under pressure to hold your airway open. Uh, and then if we can have the next slide, I'll show a little pictorial of that. The, on the left is the open airway, so when you're uh, breathing through your nose and mouth, the air passes around the back of your tongue, you know, through your palate, down into your brachia, into your bronchi, and into your lungs. You're, uh, in sleep apnea patients, when you relax, your muscles relax, including the muscles in the back of your throat, and that can cause your airway to collapse, and the air does not pass through there. Uh, what the CPAP machine does it functions as what we call a pneumatic splint to splint your airway open so that when you relax, 
your muscles can't collapse and uh, the airway does not collapse, the air passes into your lungs, you don't stop breathing, it essentially cures the problem. Next, please. The, uh, just a few other disorders. Number one, the hypersomnias. Uh, narcolepsy is the main one there. Uh, it's a disease where people will be suddenly talking to you and will fall asleep in mid-sentence. Also, they'll sometimes uh, suddenly collapse to the ground when they're excited or stimulated. Uh, it's a phenomenon we call cataplexy. Uh, it's relatively rare, but we do have quite a few patients with it. Circadian rhythm disturbances, the delayed sleep phase is usually teenagers who stay up all night and sleep in the morning. It only becomes a problem when they have to get up and go to school in the morning, uh, and then you may need to address it. Uh, advanced sleep phase is generally older adults who go to bed at 7 p.m., wake up at 2 in the morning, and wonder why they can't get back to sleep. Well, they've already had their whole night's sleep. They just didn't know it. Uh, and then the only other one I'll uh, mention is shift work. A lot of people work nights, uh, work third shift, have to sleep during the day. They do that while they're working, and then when they're off, they, they, they flip back to their other sleep schedule, which creates a lot of problems. The parasomnias typically occurred uh, uh, during childhood, but can occur into adulthood, like sleepwalking, uh, sleep-related eating, and the last one, REM behavior disorder, which some people have linked to uh, Parkinson's disease. REM behavior disorder is a condition where people act out their dreams. So, for instance, if they dream they're being chased by someone, they get up and run out of bed, may run right into the wall. Uh, so that, that, that's something, obviously, that should be brought to the doctor's attention. And the uh, next slide. Just a few more, just to mention snoring. Not everybody who snores has sleep apnea. The reverse is not true. Everybody who has sleep apnea snores. But just because you snore doesn't mean you have sleep apnea. Currently, insurance companies don't cover treatment of snoring because they don't think there are any significant adverse health effects from it. Uh, and then the long and short sleeper, everybody needs the proper amount of sleep. Some people do need more than that seven hours, some people need less, and that's usually a lifelong thing, and it really only becomes apparent by taking a real detailed history, and after you get to know the patient, you can tell, oh, that person's a short sleeper, they only need to get five or six hours a night, but that's a very difficult thing to determine. And uh, I think that's it. If there's any questions, uh, please uh, send in your questions, and we'd be happy to answer them. Yes, thank you very much. That email address where people can send in their questions, it's asksm at ssmhc.com. All right, lots of questions getting in, so we do want to get right to those. Dr. Lancer, a couple coming in for you first. Um, can an overactive brain actually wake someone up in the middle of the night? Well, I think that really relates to what I call psychophysiologic insomnia. I think that the overactive brain doesn't wake you up. You wake up generally for some other reason and then your overactive brain can't uh, or doesn't let you fall back asleep, you know, and you just can't turn that brain off. It's different when you first go to bed at night because that's when you're most tired from the day is right when you go to bed. And, and therefore, you fall asleep, but you wake up four or five hours later, now you're not quite as tired because you just slept four hours, and your brain suddenly turns on and you look at the clock and say, oh, my God, it's 2 a.m., I'm not going to be able to fall back asleep and you start worrying about it, get anxious, get a little burst of adrenaline, you're wide awake and don't fall back asleep. So I don't think it's the overactive brain waking you up, but it certainly keeps you awake. Um, another question coming in, what's the best advice for sleeping with someone who has a sleep disorder that often causes the other person to also have interrupted sleep? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I tell everybody my most important referral source for people who have uh, sleep problems is their bed partner. You know, the, husband or wife or partner in the bed who, who can't sleep because the other person is having a problem and certainly sleep apnea and restless legs are the top two there so if that's an issue you need to get your bed partner in to see the doctor and figure out what's wrong with them and and get them treated and then you'll sleep better another alternative is to just go sleep in a different bedroom but we don't recommend that what about hormones how can hormones affect a, affect, affect a sleep cycle, or, or do they? Oh, they do, and that's a very complicated question to answer, but it's uh, just to, to cut to the chase. Uh, presumably, hormones uh, is menopause when their hormones are wearing off, and women have a lot of night sweats, a lot of sleep disruption related to that. Uh, that's the most common and most uh, 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 frequent uh, uh, hormonal complaint, I guess, that we get. A treatment of that is very difficult and should be discussed with your either your gynecologist or your primary care physician because 
treating menopause is a very, very complicated uh, question that I really can't answer. All right, that makes sense. Dr. Johnson, um, a mom writing in saying her seven-year-old grinds his teeth while he sleeps. It's already causing dental issues. Um, she said he's been doing it since he was a toddler. She worries that it causes him not to get a good night's sleep, and then that next morning, next day, obviously having some crankiness because of that poor night's sleep. Any suggestions? Yeah, grinding teeth, or what we call bruxism, is a common problem, and it can be caused by several different things. Uh, one is stress or anxiety uh, can definitely cause that. Uh, in addition, misaligned teeth can cause issues with grinding. And also, uh, sleep disorder breathing. So we've talked a lot about sleep apnea. When you are trying to, uh, when you're grinding your teeth sometimes with sleep disorder breathing, you are trying to open up your airway. So you're actually pushing your airway open at the bottom and sometimes it'll grind and that can cause issues. So, And there's other causes of teeth grinding too. So are you talking to your dentist? Uh, if there's an underlying anxiety or stress, talking to your primary care provider. And if there's underlying snoring, um, it, you should probably consider looking into sleep apnea and possibly getting a sleep study. All right. Dr. Johnson, a mom writing in saying your child has a very hard time staying asleep and therefore ends up getting very little sleep. It's not the actual bedtime routine or the getting to sleep, but just doesn't stay asleep for a long time. Any advice? Well, staying asleep can be different. There can be several different problems, so it can be very complicated. Now, a lot of children, a lot of problems staying asleep and waking up at night, coming into the parents' bedroom, is has to do with how they fall asleep, so especially babies. So we always say children need to fall asleep drowsy but awake. So you naturally will wake up, uh, depending on your age and, and the individual, every hour to two hours. So multiple times a night, we cycle through different stages of sleep. Typically, you'll wake up for 30 seconds a minute. You'll adjust yourself, look around, fall back to sleep. The vast majority of individuals will, won't remember that at all. Occasionally, some patients will say, oh, I wake up for a minute and fall back right asleep. So that happens naturally. And then you can unnaturally wake up from different reasons, noises, kicking, breathing issues. So if a child does not learn to fall asleep by themselves, so often they fall asleep being rocked, they have a bottle, they have their parent next to them, they're falling asleep with the TV. If they can't fall asleep by themselves in bed and they wake up for whatever reason, a lot of times they can't fall back asleep. So there's different things you need to do to, to get them to fall asleep without your presence. And then most children, once they learn to do that after a few weeks, they will naturally be able to put themselves to sleep. Now there's other reasons to wake up too, lots of kicking. Uh, we talked about periodic limb movement disorder or sleep apnea can also wake you up at night and sometimes wake you up so much you can't fall back asleep. Uh, but those are sort of the main reasons. There's definitely other reasons too, but those are some of the main things to think about. All right, thank you. Dr. Lancer, a couple questions coming in for you. Um, someone writes in saying, my hand, arms, feet, and legs will fall asleep at night going numb. Um, wanting to know what's up with that. Well, that's not likely to be a uh, sleep problem. Uh, that person should actually uh, probably see a neurologist. Uh, there are a variety of different things that can do it. Anything from, uh, you know, laying on your nerve and, you know, compressing it. Uh, all the way to certain neck problems can do that. So they're really, that, that wouldn't be a sleep disorder, that would be a more of a neurological problem. All right, good advice. Another question coming in, if you wake up in the middle of the night and cannot go back to sleep, is it better to get up and go do something or to continue laying in bed? And also, what about watching TV in the middle of the night when you can't fall asleep? Now that, that's a very good question and, and, and the, the answer is, you're supposed to you know, maybe go to the bathroom, sip of water, go back to bed. It's not good to turn the TV on because that light from the TV stimulates your brain into thinking that it's morning time. Uh, you know, it all of a sudden says, oh, the lights are on. It must be time to get up. Same with reading, same with eating, any of those things. They tend to wake you up, uh, and, and then you can't fall back asleep. The best routine is if you do wake up during the night, Go to the bathroom if you're thirsty, a little sip of water, and then and back in bed. Another advice is to uh, don't look at the clock. You know, I, I tell everybody, get a good, reliable alarm clock and turn it so you can't see it. Uh, so set the alarm for when you need to get up in the morning and be assured it'll go off and you'll wake up. 
uh, but don't look at it during the night because what happens is you wake up and it's two o'clock in the morning and you lay there for a little while. You look again and it's two fifteen. Like oh my gosh, I haven't fallen asleep and that just stresses you out. And then you look again and it's two twenty five and it's like oh I'm never going to fall asleep. And every time you do that, you just get a little bit more of a burst of adrenaline, which just serves to keep you awake even longer. So don't look at the clock. Don't watch TV. Don't read a book. Don't go get something to eat. Those are all myths that people have sort of built up, and you know they say, "Oh, I can't fall asleep without the TV on," but it's just not true. Uh, you just it's just like Dr. Johnson said with kids, you got you know certain adults fall into bad behaviors, and you need to break that behavior, uh, and eventually you will if you just don't turn the TV on or whatever. All right, thank you. Dr. Johnson, a couple different questions. Um, parents wanting to know how you can help a young child, especially that three and four year old range, to sleep in their own bed. So that's a very tough question, and uh, but I think three or four year olds are definitely um, are an age at where you can accomplish that. It's tougher than a little bit younger children, but so it goes back to the sleep hygiene, the sleep schedule. Uh, going through the sleep schedule and getting them to fall asleep in their bed by themselves. So that's where the problem is. Uh, a lot of these children, uh, there's different types of uh, behavioral methods that you can use. Um, one common one we use, it's a, sort of a modified, what we call graduate extinction. Uh, you have your three or four year old stay in bed and say, okay, I'm going to come and check on you in one minute. And then you leave and you come back in a minute. You say, oh, I'm going to come check on you in two minutes. But when you check on them, just go in and say, okay, I'm going to give you a thumbs up. And then you can go three minutes and four minutes. A lot of times we'll say, if you're asleep by the four-minute mark, we'll give you, you get a surprise in the morning. And that could be something simple as, such as a uh, five, ten minutes of walking, watching Mickey Mouse, their, their favorite food, a sticker. And if they fall asleep by that four-minute mark, um, you know, they, they get that reward. But what that does is sort of reassure them that you're coming back uh, it allows them to relax and comforts them. And then you can sort of spread it for eight, four minutes, eight minutes, 16 minutes. And as they, as they get able to do that, expand that. And those are just sort of rough times. And there's lots of other types of behavioral methods too, but some, those are some of the basic things that we'll try. That's a great piece of advice. When do you tell your patients to make that transition um, from the crib to the bed, whether it's a toddler bed or a twin bed or a day bed, something like that? So that can vary a lot, too. I mean, typically children, there's a big range of when children go from a crib to a toddler bed. So one is if they're able to climb out, uh, which uh, that can vary. You can get some young children, especially boys, that are climbing out at a year and a half if they have particular, you know, they like to climb it. And you can have three and a half year olds that won't attempt to climb it, so it can really vary. Uh, in general, so that's one. If they're starting to climb out or you think they're pretty close, you that that's a danger. Uh, we typically recommend that children, they, that parents keep their children in the crib as long as possible. Um, it goes to the point that if they're not sleeping well and they come out, they're, now they're mobile and they can come into your room and go do stuff. Uh, typically with a lot of the cribs, well, the manufacturers will say if they're over 35 inches tall, uh, although that can vary a lot with ages, but you know that could be a young child or older depending on their height. Uh, if the crib is coming past their mid chest, that's sort of a manufacturer's recommendation. Uh, so those are things to think about, but I always try to keep them in as long as possible. Now, a lot of families are having a second child, uh, and they need that crib for the new baby. Uh, so that's obviously something to think about, too. If you do make that transition, you want to do it at least three months before the anticipated due date or three months later. It's already quite a bit of change with the new baby coming, especially if, they're, if it's your second child. So if you're going to make that transition, try to decide, okay, we're going to work on it three months before because it can be a tough transition or three months after. Um, because if you need that crib, I would recommend three months after, but if you need the bed or you don't have another sleeping arrangement because of a newborn, uh, definitely through one year old, they need a separate sleep environment that's flat, uh, that's separate from the parent, and uh, typically that's the crib. Um, so you know, those are things to think about. That's great advice. Dr. Johnson, um, let's talk for a moment about night tears in children. Any strategies for dealing with them while they're happening? In the moment, how should you be dealing with a night tear? So night tears, also known as sleep tears, or it can be pretty, uh, you know, when they first happen, uh, to, to let a lot of people, 
to let individuals know who don't know about it. So it's, it's similar to sleepwalking, but it's a little bit different. It happens in sleep, deep sleep, which is about 25% of your sleep, and you get the most of that at the beginning of the night, and it sort of fades throughout the end of the night. But it's typically when a child will wake up, and they will be screaming, and they're panicked, and if you look at them, they'll look straight through you like you're not even there. Um, and it's pretty dramatic, because you, especially the first time parents are coming in, like, what is going on? My child uh, won't respond to me. Um, so, you know, what you, every child is different. Uh, we usually recommend not letting it ride out. Typically, most of the time, it'll just last a couple minutes, although they can last much longer. Um, but if you try to wake them, a lot of times you can get what's called a confusional arousal, and you can even make it worse. Now, every child's different, so some children you can wake up, but a lot of them, you, so in general, we say let it run its course and uh, let them go through, uh, just, you know, let them uh, run its course. Occasionally, blowing in their face or throwing some water on their face can wake them up, but again, that can also make them worse. So let it run its course. Now, in terms, there's no direct treatment for sleep tears, but there are things we can do, making sure they have good sleep hygiene, avoiding caffeine, and if they have an underlying disorder, such as restless leg or sleep apnea, uh, which a lot of them do. If we treat those, they often get a lot better. So, um, you know, we see success with that. And there are some other uh, more complicated behavioral treatments that aren't the most successful, but that's sort of some baseline things we do. All right, thank you. Dr. Lancer, a couple questions coming in about naps. Are naps good? Uh, do you recommend a nap for an adult, and how long would that nap be? Well, I, I've had many of my patients that heard me say my goal in life is to be able to take a 30-minute nap every day. Uh, so far, I can't, remember the, I can't remember the last time I took one, but that's my ultimate goal. Uh, the answer is I generally don't recommend naps, but as long as the nap is relatively short, it's probably not going to be harmful. Uh, what, what, what the problem is, people tend to lay down for a nap, and of course they don't set an alarm, and they wake up three hours later, and then wonder why they can't sleep at night. Uh, so it, it's a little bit problematic if you're taking a long nap. If you take a 15-minute nap or a 30-minute nap, it's probably not going to cut into your nighttime sleep a lot. But um, you know, it's, it's something that just uh, some people find very refreshing. Uh, so it's not really harmful as long as it's short, but we don't recommend it uh, on a routine basis. All right, so keep them short if you're going to do them. What about alarm, eating? Plan it. What about eating right before sleep? Is there an issue with that? Well, y y yes and no. I mean, uh, so some people find that the, a little snack before bedtime uh, kind of, how shall I put it, tides them over until morning. Uh, but again, again, it's not anything that's recommended as part of your routine uh, uh, nighttime sleep habit. Uh, generally, you know, people should eat, uh, you know, no sooner than a few hours before uh, their bedtime. And, uh, and afterward, at most, you know, just a little bit to drink. You obviously don't want to drink a ton right before you go to bed because then you're going to have a full bladder and need to wake up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. So, so again, you know, try and cut out the eating and drinking before you go to bed. That makes sense. Dr. Lancer, we have an email coming in um, saying that she's getting seven hours of sleep an evening, but still just isn't feeling rested. Um, any advice or suggestions? Well, that, that, that's probably the most common complaint that people come in with. You know, I'm, I'm sleeping all night and I'm still tired during the day. And, and, and there are two possibilities, well, multiple possibilities. One, generally, you're not getting enough sleep. Like I said, some people need more than seven hours. Number two, uh, people uh, have sleep disorders that interrupt their sleep. And I'll just use sleep apnea as an example. The person who has sleep apnea rarely is aware that they've got a problem. They're just tired. You know, they go to bed at night, they sleep all night, they can sleep eight, ten hours, and they'll wake up and they're still tired. And the reason is because the sleep apnea is disturbing their sleep to the point they're never getting any good sustained sleep. They're not getting any good what we call REM sleep. And so even though they've been in bed for eight hours, they're tired because they didn't get a very good sleep. And so, you know, if a person snores and they sleep eight hours and they're still tired and, you know, they fit the criteria, they may have sleep apnea. Uh, same for restless legs. Every time you go to sleep, your legs are jerking and hip kicking. They keep you from falling into a deep sleep, and then you're tired when you wake up in the morning. 
And so again, you know, does the person have restless legs? Are they kicking their bed partner all night long? Do they wake up with the sheets on the floor because their legs are moving all night long? There are a whole variety of different uh, things that can do that. That is without a doubt the most common thing that people like, keep people in the sleep clinic for. All right, thank you. Dr. Johnson, we have an email saying that um, I have a two-year-old who never slept through the night until just a few months ago. Sometimes, though, that toddler is still waking up around 3 to 4 a.m. after going to sleep between 9 or 10 p.m. Is that common? Um, is it just maybe a phase, or is there something they need to do as parents? Well, so that is common, so that's good that, you know, two-year-olds are the toughest to get to sleep through the night if they because a lot of times they're, they're already out of the crib and two-year-olds don't quite know uh, reward systems as well as uh, older children so yeah it's not that uncommon um, you know especially early morning awakenings if a child naturally or unnaturally wakes up at three or four o'clock a lot of times they've slept enough that they it doesn't push them through to sleep till the morning so I think with that continuing to do all the things we talked about and having good sleep hygiene, making sure they fall asleep by themselves, drowsy but awake, because if they do wake up and say, oh, I fell asleep and mom and dad were next to me, I'm going to go go see them because to fall back asleep, I need that. So making sure they do that. If they, if they, Even if you're doing everything perfect, they can still come in your room. Um, so really making sure that you're strict and not letting them um, uh, come in your room and taking them back and saying, no, you need to stay in bed until the morning. Um, part of the problem is sometimes children don't know when it's time to wake up. So uh, at that age, most children will understand, well, it's okay to wake up when mom and dad wake me up or the sun rises. Or for some children that are consistently waking up early, uh, maybe not like three or four, but five or six, we'll do what's called a good morning clock. Um, and you can set an, a clock that the light turns on, or you can actually buy those at uh, some bookstores and stuff, where the light will turn on and say, okay, now it's time that Mr. Clocks woke up so I can come wake up. So, but going back, I think just, it is normal, but being very consistent and using some of those tools, making sure they, they fall asleep by themselves. And most children, if you're consistent with that, will, will stay in their own bed. All right, good to know. Um, another viewer writes in saying they have a two-year-old daughter who has major sleep issues. That being said, she's also a very poor eater. Lunch, they say, is the worst, but she's a picky eater all day long. Do you have any thoughts on if there's a connection between her being a picky eater and that poor eating to her poor sleep? So it's not that uncommon for two-year-olds to be poor, picky eaters. Um, I mean, it can be more complex, so definitely talking to their primary care provider about that. But uh, the big thing about being a picky eater is, is she growing? Is she following her growth curve? Which, uh, you know, that can be talked about with primary. But yeah, I mean, some picky eaters, it can result in some sleep issues. A lot of that goes back to, especially if they don't get enough iron, if they don't get enough meat and greens, it can result in... Uh, iron deficiency, which we see a lot in our clinic, and iron deficiency can result in restless leg syndrome type symptoms. Now, you can imagine uh, a two-year-old telling you their legs are restless. It can be difficult for them to explain, so it can be hard to diagnose, but we see that a lot in clinic. And so a lot of these children with low iron levels, if we get their iron levels up to the average, a lot of the children that are real restless, uh, they stop being as restless and they kick less at night and they sleep better. So that's one. Uh, two, caffeine. Uh, definitely, as we talked about, uh, caffeine can uh, disrupt sleep and keep you awake. So that can include not only colas, but chocolate. So avoiding those. And, so, and if there's any food allergies that disrupts their sleep uh, or any food allergies that disrupts them, that can cause behavioral problems, make them irritable and they can't sleep. And, uh, and sometimes sugars can, different kids will react differently to different foods and stuff. So, and there might be some underlying other issues too. I mean, uh, that they, they might want to talk to their primary care provider about, if, especially if the child's not growing. All right, thank you. Dr. Lancer, a question about sleep talking. Um, a viewer writing in saying, what can I do to stop my constant talking in my sleep and restlessness? Well, the, the restlessness and the sleep talking are generally two different things. The uh, sleep talking is a very difficult thing to treat and get rid of. Um, you know, some people, of course, associate it with what they eat before they go to bed. If they 
have chocolate at night, they talk in their sleep or whatever. You know, so if there are certain substances or things that you do that seem to trigger the talking in your sleep, you should avoid them. Um, you know, unless it's disturbing to the patient or to the bed partner, it's a problem we generally don't treat um, because it's uh, the treatment may be more harmful than the condition itself. The restlessness may be a different issue. Again, it may be a restless legs problem. Restless legs and sleep talking are not necessarily linked to each other, so that may need to be investigated separately, uh, the restlessness itself. Dr. Lanzer, what can you do about a CPAP machine that stops sealing halfway through the night? Uh, I presume the mask, they mean the mask is not sealing. Uh, you know, as I explained, for the CPAP machine to work, it's got to connect you know, with a hose to a mask that seals around your nose or around your nose and mouth. And uh, some people, when they move around during the night, the mask will get moved around a little bit and it'll start leaking. Uh, other times, people might sweat, and the moisture between the, the skin and the mask will allow the air to kind of leak out in that particular area. Also, some people, you know, their pressure machine, their CPAP machines, the pressures are adjustable, and they reach higher pressures at night uh, when they're sleeping uh, in deeper sleep. And the higher pressure, the higher the pressure, the more likely it is to leak. And so you really have to kind of troubleshoot, you know, what time of night is it, what position are you in, uh, and a variety of different factors that play into it. And sometimes it's as simple as just getting a different mask, one that fits a little bit differently. Uh, other times it's a matter of, uh, uh, you know, if there's a, uh, certain products that will help to seal between your mask and your skin. Uh, they're commercially available that, that will help to make that seal and prevent them from leaking during the night. So I presume that's what they're meaning. The mask is leaking. The machines themselves, if the machine is leaking, then it needs to be, if it's broken, it needs to be fixed. So I, I think they're talking about the mask. Dr. Lancer, um, I feel like this is probably a pretty common question. Um, people writing in saying they know, they're well aware that they need to get more sleep, but with everything going on in their life as a parent, as an employee, you know, it's hard to get to bed at a decent time. Any advice that you've given some of your patients in the past on how to actually make it happen? Well, that's really the million-dollar question, and I, I think you know if you look at the studies of sleep in America today, that's the that's the fact is that people are so busy with their lives, we consider sleep to be not important, and so when we have other things to do, we cut down uh, the amount of sleep. I mean, I'll use myself as an example. I get up every morning early so that I can exercise because if I save it till later in the day, I'm too tired to do it. And what did I do? I started sleeping less so that I could do my exercise in the morning. Now, fortunately, I've been doing it so long, I started going to bed earlier because I'm getting older, and so now I'm getting back to my seven hours of sleep a night. But I think the most important thing is people need to you know, recognize that sleep is, is very important. As Dr. Johnson said, sleep is essential for our health, and if we don't get sleep, we're going to be less healthy. And once you make it a higher priority, it's easier to set aside time to sleep. It becomes more important. Uh, you know, I think our lifestyles nowadays are so chaotic with our children and, and sports and other interests and, and, uh, and work that we just lose sight of the fact that we've got to take care of ourselves first. Great advice. Thank you. Dr. Johnson, we need to talk a little bit about sleep training. A lot of emails coming in about that. Um, is that the appropriate term for it for your getting your baby on your infant on a schedule? Um, and what does that really look like? So yeah, sleep training is a sort of general term in trying to get your uh, baby to sleep through the night or your child, young child. So I, you know, a, a good way to sort of from starting from the beginning is as a, uh, a baby comes home from the hospital, you're sort of feeding the baby on demand. Uh, so early on, the first several weeks, uh, first couple months, the first thing you want to do is really train the baby to sleep at night and not during or the majority of the sleep at night, but they're going to definitely nap a ton throughout the day. So at night, try not to keep when you do when the baby does wake up to to eat, uh, making sure that the lights are very dim uh, and that you don't stimulate. You want to stimulate your baby during the day. You don't want to be playing with the baby at night. 
Uh, so try to get those nights and days lined up, and then during the day have lots of bright light, lots of uh, try to interact with them. And then once they're a few months old, once they're about three months old, you really want to start incorporating the bedtime routine, which I talked about before, so, so they sort of know that, hey, this is the time for my long period of sleep. Uh, and then you want to, you know, once they start to get the schedule going, um, three or four months, you really want them to fall asleep drowsy but awake or even earlier than that. And that goes to what I was talking about earlier. The baby, the baby's going to wake up every hour, hour and a half naturally, and, uh, and they have to learn to put themselves back to sleep. So easier said than done. It's not always easy. Most children are going to be sleeping the, a good majority of the night by four to six months, but not all of them. Uh, but if you continue to work on that. Now at six months, uh, if they're growing well, uh, they're 14, 16 plus pounds, and they're falling asleep, you're putting them in bed drowsy but awake, and they're still having lots of issues. There's additional type of sleep training. You can, some people recommend doing it. You can do it a little bit earlier, a little bit later. If they're not sick, uh, there's different things, in the, what we call extinction, or lay, laying them down and letting them cry. Uh, which that can be very difficult for parents. Uh, I've experienced myself, and sometimes you got to send one of the parents away. Uh, but it works uh, for a lot of a lot of parents. And there's other types of methods where the parent lays on the floor. And there's also what's called graduated extinction, sort of known as the Ferber method, where you leave the room and you come back and check on them, sort of like we were talking about. That you check on them in a minute, then two minutes, then three minutes, with very little stimulation. And so, all, and there's other methods too. And you, so, those are different types of sleep training. The, the, you really, there's not a one size fits all. I mean, some of the initial things we talked about, but it has to be customized because every parent has different tolerances and stuff. Uh, and then you have to factor in if the child's teething um, or if they're sick. So that's sort of a general overview of sleep training that, that uh, we commonly do. Any, since it is, you know, like you said, there's a lot more to it. Any additional resources that you would recommend for parents? Uh, I mean, there's uh, there's some different books out there. Some of them have different uh, specific uh, methods. I mean, definitely we do that in clinic. Uh, so I I do that. Uh, there's uh, some different authors. I think Mendel. Uh, it's either Mendel or Owens uh, has a good book, Sleeping, Getting Your Child to Sleep Through the Night. Um, she, she does a very good job with that and teaches a lot of professionals. All right, great. Well, from babies to teenagers, a lot of people writing in about teenagers and sleep issues that they're having. Um, one person saying, I have a teenager that since a child has had a hard time going to sleep, and once he does go to sleep, waking constantly. So pretty much getting about four hours of sleep every night. Um, what's your advice, and what's the next step they need to be taking as a family? So. That's obviously going to impact the child in terms of being able to perform optimally. So, I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty complicated issue. I think starting out with a lot of the basic things of sleep schedule and sleep hygiene, but for a lot of individuals that works, for a lot of them they don't. That individual has those bad sleep problems probably definitely needs to be seen by a sleep prof uh, professional and try to really break down why are they having problems sleeping uh, and try to solve if they have underlying anxiety, they have underlying rest slate, they have underlying sleep apnea, uh, assuming that the sleep hygiene and stuff is good. And some individuals, we don't like to use medicines in children. There's, there's nothing that's uh, FDA approved, but some children, some teenagers, we work through all those things, we treat everything, and some individuals just need medicines and uh, the other behavioral treatments fell. And uh, especially, you know, so I think they need to see a sleep professional explore those options. Um, Medicines, if everything else fails, is sometimes needed, especially if everything else fails in, in teenagers. Dr. But, uh, All right, thank you. Okay. Dr. Lancer, um, talk about, you know, in your professional opinion, what is, the re what is that um, point where someone does need to seek professional help, and what does that look like? It is, is it a sleep consultation? Is it automatically to a sleep lab? Um, tell people a little bit about what they could potentially expect. Well, first of all, when should someone come in? I think when, when someone is having a problem either with their sleep or with being too sleepy during the day, and, and it's obviously starting to affect their life in some way or their spouse or bed partner's life in some way. You know, So people are having trouble staying awake at work or trouble concentrating or vice versa. Their bed partner's having the same problems. 
then you need to get it checked out. And the, and the first step is always to talk to your primary care physician and let them know that it's a real problem. Uh, a lot of times people mention their sleep problems as the doctor's walking out the door and says, oh, by the way, doc, my wife says I snore. You know, and, and the doctor says, well, we all snore and out the door he goes. You know, you need to let them know ahead of time that this is a serious problem. It's interfering with your life or your bed partner's life. You know, and, and if it's significant, many times it, it generates a referral for a, a consultation. And in our situation, uh, we have a sleep clinic in our office that people come in and, and we take a sleep history. Myself and a, a respiratory therapist who works with me uh, will take a sleep history and we'll formulate a plan based on that history and the examination on what to do. Uh, if, if sleep apnea, which is, again, the most common thing we see as suspect, then that would then generate uh, either a, an in-lab in the hospital, in lab sleep study or a home sleep study, and then depending on the results, would then generate treatment uh, based on the results either with CPAP or some other method. Um, if it's a non sleep apnea problem, then again, in the sleep clinic, we would evaluate the history and decide what the problem is and what the potential treatments are, and that may require, you know, cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy if it's an insomnia problem. Or, or other things depending on what the, what the situation demands. But, um, but again, you know, you should come in when it's a problem, you know, if it's starting to bother you and be serious with yourself and be real. If it's, you know, don't say, oh, you know, I've only had to pull over three times in the last six years. That's not that bad, you know. Well, if you're so sleepy when you're driving, you gotta pull over, uh, it's a problem. You should get checked, you know. Don't, be, don't belittle uh, some of these issues. Absolutely. Our last question today, um, I'll ask both of you, and we, because we are getting it dealing with both adults and with pediatrics, let's talk a little bit about melatonin. Um, is it recommended? Um, Dr. Lanther, would you mind answering first? Well, uh, I, I will say I do recommend melatonin in some people. Uh, you know, the, what happens is when, the, when it starts to get dark out at night, our brain recognizes the dropping light and it releases melatonin which is a signaling agent for our brain that it's nighttime and it's time to turn off and go to sleep. Um, you know, and one of the things Dr. Johnson was talking about with the dark night when the kids are dark room when the kids are going to bed is to do this to set to allow the melatonin to be released and tell us it's time to go to sleep. And the bright lights during the day just, you know, sets your basically sets your biological clock dark dark at night bright during the day, melatonin increases at night, our brain senses the increasing melatonin and goes to sleep. So sometimes in people who have circadian rhythm disturbances in a variety of other situations, I will recommend melatonin to try and help a little bit to set that biological clock. All right, and Dr. Johnson, what um, about you when dealing with pediatrics is melatonin recommended? So. Uh, I do use it some uh, for certain certain uh, patients, you know, and there's no, like I mentioned, FDA-approved medicine for sleep in children, but melatonin is used. As Dr. Lancer said, uh, as the light goes down, uh, our body secretes melatonin. Uh, we try to do all the behavioral methods. If that does not work and, you know, we've done everything else, melatonin is one of the first things I use. The problem with melatonin, it helps you fall asleep. It doesn't usually help you stay asleep. So. Uh, that's an issue, and there's also for some individuals, not everybody, uh, tolerance develops, and you slowly have to increase the dose, or it stops working completely. Um, so that that's the potential problem. We think it's pretty safe in kids. It's used a lot, uh, especially in uh, a lot of northern countries and Scandinavian stuff where there's not a lot of light uh, during the winter, so uh, or or it's light all all summer, uh, so the the light fluctuates more. We think it's pretty safe. Um, there's concerns about it might throw off hormones a little bit around puberty, but uh, that's mostly theoretical. So, uh, so for certain kids, it can be life changing, and there's certain definitely parents that have done a lot of different things and they've really struggled. And melatonin has been the answer. Uh, but before I, you know, before parents do that, uh, I definitely encourage them to be evaluated by a, uh, a sleep professional. Uh, and uh, work on a lot of different things. But if needed, melatonin is an option I use. All right, well, thank you very much. 
And thank you to everyone who sent in all those questions. Thank you to Dr. Johnson, Dr. Lancer for sharing really valuable information for everyone. Um, and if you're looking for more information about the topic of sleep or providers in your area, please visit our website, ssmhealth.com live. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you.